through a few quickly. If you look at your outline, first of all, some lessons from Job. And I've told you a lot about Job, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about Job in this series. But uh, number one, express to God exactly how you feel. Always express, don't suppress. And I think God teaches us that through nature. Uh, do you always inhale? No, you exhale, okay? You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, right? You breathe in, you breathe out. What does the doctor tell you when you have breathing problems, Brother the Lord? Take deep breaths, okay? Go to Colorado, get some fresh air, go up the mountains, I'm telling you. Uh, any other been to Yellowstone or Colorado? Oh, my soul, the air is so sweet and fresh. You think there are honeysuckles nearby. But express, don't suppress. And then release, don't repress. Confess, don't conceal. And then be honest, not pretentious. By the way, God knows everything. God knows how you feel. God knows you hurt. So don't be pretentious. Don't try to be super spiritual. Just, uh, I think the greatest thing that I have done in my time of grieving is just, I would be alone, but I would just release everything. If you would have been out in a certain lake in this area, the first anniversary of my son's death, you would have heard moaning and groaning and crying and uh, like you never heard of anything. Man, that man is hurting bad. Well, that was me, and I was just releasing a lot of things that I concealed. So, just release. And then, number two, accept help from others. God said it's not good that man should be alone, right? So, God doesn't want us to be isolated. We need support from sincere, non judgmental, caring believers. We need comfort from other people. Isn't it wonderful when somebody comforts you? You know, when you're, when you're in pain, you like, like to be comforted. I thought about that whenever the doctor was cutting on me. And by the way, she said, you know, I'm not, you're not going to feel a thing. Right. I said, if you told me I'm feeling, how come I'm feeling that? No, you're not feeling that. I said, I'm feeling it. And then when she sewed it up, it's like, I said, do you do a lot of sewing at home? And she said, no, not really. I said, but it feels like you're cross-stitching on my face right now. She said, oh, you can't feel that. I said, yeah, I can too. I can feel the thread going through my skin. Is that thread or what is it? Sutures? Okay, I can feel it. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? I said, she said, you don't feel that. I said, I do too. So I don't know. Maybe I'm super sensitive or something. And then a wonderful thought <laughs> that I gave you. <laughs> but anyway, um, we need comfort. And I thought about that because I, I, I was looking for some band-aids that would help. And I thought about getting like little airplanes, a little Mickey Mouse, and you know, putting it on here so we all have something pretty to look at. And uh, do what? Yeah, <laughs> okay. But uh, but you remember when you were a kid, you loved it when your mom would just, you know, put a band-aid on and give you a little kiss. Remember that? You just loved it. Oh, I think I need two kisses this time. Okay. Now, your dad wasn't very comfortable, but your mom was, you know? So, but we all like that. So accept help from others. And then, number three, only God knows our pains. Okay? He does, really. Only God knows our pains. And God reveals, but He also conceals. God doesn't owe us an explanation. And our minds cannot comprehend God. Um, you know, do you realize that even if God explained to you what all was, He was doing in your life, you couldn't understand it. It wouldn't make sense. Do you realize that? You say, why, why do you say that, Pastor? You know, I have people all the time say, Pastor, you know, there's, there's things in the Bible I just I read, but I don't understand. Did you know the Bible really tells us about the mind of God? This book is so deep. I started reading and studying this book when I was 17 years old. And you think about now, I've mastered this book. Sometimes I think, man, I don't know a thing about this Bible. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper the more that I study. God is constantly revealing new truths here. God is showing me all sorts of wonderful things. You cannot exhaust the resource of the Bible. Amen. And things that happen in our lives, there's no way we can possibly comprehend what God is doing. Even if even it can be explained to it, in our finite mind, we couldn't receive it. But you find that, uh, that uh, our minds cannot comprehend God, but someday God will make it all clear to us. And then I concluded this morning by telling you not to blame God or doubt His love. Never, ever do that. Um, even though people may be close to you, want to understand you, they want to understand the pain, they want to help you. 
You say, why did Joel's wife say that? I don't know why she said that. You can ask her someday in heaven. But I think she was probably expressing the way that she felt. Now, B, trust Him even when you don't understand. Now this verse, if you're there in the book of Job, chapter 13, verse 15, I think is probably the heart of the book of Job. Because I don't think at this point Job understood, but he did understand that he was to trust God. And in Job 13, verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. What a great truth. Though he slay me. In other words, he said, God, I don't know what you're doing, and you may end up just killing me, but I'm still going to trust you. Wow. I wonder if we could say that. As I mentioned this morning, for 37 chapters, Job asked, why, 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 why? And then in chapter 38, God asked Job some questions. And uh, 39 times in the book of Job, you find the word no, K-N-O-W. And if you look at chapter 19, if you're there, notice what God showed Job. In chapter 19, he said, for I know, there's the word K-N-O-W, Again, you find it 39 times in this book. Uh, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. There's so many great doctrinal truths right here in just these three verses. And only, it's only by revelation that Job received this. Revelation simply means that God revealed this to Job. All right? Now, here's something I want to spend a little bit of time on, and I didn't get this far this morning, but I want you to see this. In Psalm 100, verse 5, the Bible says, For the Lord is good. Do you believe that? If you believe that, say amen. 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 The Lord is good. You know, if you don't memorize any verse of the Bible, you ought to memorize that verse. You just that first part, Psalm 100, verse 5. It'd be a great thing if you woke up every morning and you'd say this, the Lord is good. God, you're good. God, you're good all the time. All the time, you're good. God is good. Never, ever, ever doubt the goodness of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You're in bad shape if you start doubting His goodness. The Bible says, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Now, what do I mean by making affirmations of your faith? In other words, out loud, I think regularly you should just mention things that you really believe about God. Let me give you some examples. God, you're good. God, you're loving. God, you're protective. God, you're all-knowing. God, you're so powerful. God, I'm not in control. You're in control. God, I don't know what's going to happen the next second of my life, but you do, and you have a purpose, and you have a plan for my life. You see, when you affirm those things, God is pleased. And I think sometimes God just wants us to realize that we're not in control. He's in control. That we realize how much He loves us and we just ought to regularly make affirmations of our faith. And then another important lesson is this. Learn to move during changes of your life. You see, folks, life is constantly changing. Have you figured that out yet? Constant changes in life. It's kind of like you driving in an automobile. You go on vacation. Say, where are you going? Oh, on vacation, I'm going up to Washington State. And we're going to have a great time there. We're going to meet with our relatives. Okay. How are you going to go? Well, we're going to drive. Oh. Where are you going to go through? You can tell all the states you can go through. Now, I want to tell you, as you're driving there, and if you're looking out the window, you see all sorts of beautiful scenery, but it's constantly changing. And I want to tell you, as you look and behold it, it's like, oh, there's a mountain. Oh, there's a lake. Oh, there's a river. Oh, look at that. There's a big city. Whoa, there's something else. Now, folks, that's kind of how life is. Life is constantly changing. Let me give you two references in the Bible. In the book of Ruth, chapters 1 
in chapters 2, you find that Ruth, um, you know, they didn't adjust real good to changes. In other words, first of all, her husband, the boy's father, died. And then the two boys died. And after the two boys died, Ruth said, man, I need to go, I need to go back to Bethlehem. I don't know anybody here. I'm living in Moab. Man, this is a heathen country. I don't need to be here. So she went back. Now, folks, I don't understand all that happened in Ruth's life. But let me tell you, as she gradually went back and she began to look at what had happened and what was happening in her life, all of a sudden, and, and I don't think even at the end of the life, she fully understood what God was doing. But when she held that little baby that Ruth had, even to the day she died, she had no idea that this was going to be a descendant of King David. And David would be in the lineage, the genealogy of baby Jesus, the Savior of the world. And probably right now in heaven, she's scratching her head like, whoa. I thought my life was over. It was ended. It was awful. I hated everything that was going on. And I had no idea God was positioning me for some of the greatest things that I could ever experience as a human being. Now, folks, that's exactly how it is with us. We have no idea what all God is doing. And even the day we die, we may not fully understand. But God is doing something bigger than ourselves. Do you believe that? Yes. I believe that with all my heart. Now, let me give you another passage. And you want to keep this, again, make your little file in the back of your mind and follow this way. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. Here's what the scripture says. To everything, there is a season. Did you get that? Everything. 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 You know, I wish sometimes life would just freeze. Let me give you an example. You remember when your babies were born? I don't think there's anything sweeter on this earth than a little baby's face. A little chuggy cheese. A little young to play with. And their little toes are so pudgy. You sit there. Play with their little toes, little fingers. You look at them, they, you, you make them laugh. And you look at those little things, oh, please, stay like that forever and ever. You're so sweet, you're love, so loving. But then they start growing, and they start changing. Then they become teenagers, they become sarcastic and all conscious. And you just want to, you know, put them in a little box and seal them and just, you know, ship them off to China and say, come back and see me in 20 years, you know? But what I'm saying is, folks, you, you wish sometimes you could forget, but life is costly. It's, there's, there's change. But the Bible says there, to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. All right? So learn to adapt with the changes. Now, let me give you a last thought here. Uh, face the future with courage. Face the future with courage. Now, here's a classic example in the Bible. Now, in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verse 16 through 23, and I've got it there on your outline. You can read it later. Let me, let me just give you the story. Nathan the prophet had just visited David, and here's what Nathan said. Nathan said, the baby is going to die today. And so the baby got sick as soon as he left. And so David went, and he fell on his face. He would not eat anything for seven days. All of the men around him were worried about David. They said, my goodness, he's crying. He's just weeping, just uncontrollably. He's not eating anything. There's something bad wrong with David. He asked everybody to leave him alone. He was praying. He was fasting. And then he, the men started whispering around him when they heard the news that the baby died. And they said, how are we going to explain this to him? You know what, if we tell him the baby died, it could push him over the edge. He could lose it. And David heard him whispering. And he got up and he said, is the baby dead? He said, yes, the baby's dead. He got up. He went and showered. He shaved. He got something to eat. And then here's what he said. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Especially people that lose babies. He said, I cannot bring my baby back to me, but there'll be a day where I'll go and be with him. Yeah. I'll be with him. And then David went about his business. Now follow me. Here's what happened. 
There was a time that David mourned. There was a time where David prayed. There was a time where David fasted. You see, he dedicated himself to perhaps God would forgive him and God would spare the baby's life. But when God took the baby, he said, you know what? That was a chapter in my life. It was probably a dark chapter. And I wish it never happened. But I can't stop living my life. I've got to continue living. I've got to press on. Now, listen to me. Very few people can do that. Why is it that many people live in the past? Why is it that people drive through life looking through their rearview mirror? Why is it that people just are constantly looking at the back, wanting to change things? Folks, you cannot change things. Only God can change things. But you can't change the past. So you've got to learn to adapt. Now, let me give you one closing thought here. Follow me on your outline. God is bigger than your loss or your pain. Here's the question that probably people ask more than anything. Where was God, and you just fill in the blank, when I lost my mother, when I lost my child, when I had a horrible accident and I lost my, one of my legs or my arms? Where was God when I went through this horrible, horrible time in my life? Where was God? You know, I don't have all the answers, and I'm not trying to seem sarcastic in any way. But folks, whatever pain you've experienced in your life, I'll tell you where God was. He was in the very same place that he was when he saw his son brutally being beaten. And I want to tell you, you cannot even comprehend the pain that a holy, righteous, almighty God felt, which at any time he could have spoken and put an end, not only to those people, but to the entire human race. But he didn't. Because he was paying for your sin and for my sin. But don't you think for a second that God the Father did not feel the pain that Jesus was feeling. Just like you would feel if you were to see your son being brutally beaten and murdered. Don't tell me you wouldn't feel anything. But God experienced that. Let me say this. Four thoughts I want to give you. First of all, grief is good. Have you ever heard somebody in their favor saying, it's good grief? <laughs> well, the way grief is good. The problem in our society is that we don't grieve. You know, and, and honestly, one of the things that I hope I address during this series is don't be guilty of telling people, okay, you know, it's been two weeks since, since this death. Come on, get over it. Folks, you'll never get over the death of a close loved one. Somebody that you love. And the greater the love, the greater the grieving. It's just like if you lost your leg or you lost your arm and I'm up to you five years later. Oh, come on, Ron, get over it. You lost your leg, but get over it. Pastor, I can't walk without a limp. I can't get over it. i got to have these crutches and I've got this artificial leg. No, you never get over it. You learn to cope. You learn to adapt. But you never get over it, folks. A part of you is gone. But grief can be good. You say, why, why do you say that, Pastor? Listen, Isaiah 53, verse 3 said this about Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with what? Grief. Grief. If Jesus grieved, by the way, Jesus did not sin. Why do we treat people that are grieving like they're sinning, like they're doing something wrong? That's not sin. That's healthy. It's healthy for you to grieve. And the problem with us is we're living in a society where we're saying, don't grieve, get over it, move on. No. Matter of fact, now I encourage people to grieve. I encourage people, look, if you feel like crying, if you don't feel like going to work, if you don't feel like going to bed and getting out of bed, listen, you just grieve all that you need to grieve. Because I'm going to tell you, it's healthy. You know, we sing that song, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him. Well, one of the things about Jesus was he grieved. And I wonder, do we grieve as Jesus grieved? Secondly, I want you to see that bitterness is bad. You know, pain will not kill you, but bitterness will destroy you. Did you know that? 
And when you resent things in the past, you're bitter. No, no, I just, I just resent it. No, you're bitter. You're bitter. Well, I'll tell you what. I, if I could go back, you know what? Just give it to God. Give it to God. God can take care of it. But the only person you hurt when you, you're, you're bitter, when you resent, you're hurting yourself. Um, let me ask you a question. Can you change the past? No. So why do we linger on the past? And then thirdly, grief is God's tool. Did you know that there's no growth without change? Did you know from the moment you're born to now, your body's, your body's changing every day? This morning, Sunday school, I don't know how we got started on it. We were talking about, uh, well, I'll tell you how I got started. I saw my brother sent me a picture of me when I was like 18 years old. <laughs> I had a full head of hair, folks. And, uh, and I was skinny as could be. I said, is that me? And then I saw a picture of David Temple when he was 18 years old. Y'all don't know David. He was tall and skinny. He looked like a crane because he'd always stand with his foot propped up like that. But, and, and then I told about Lee. <laughs> Lee Edmonds showed me a picture of him on a motorcycle with long hair and skinny as can be. Like, you sure that's you, Lee? Mm -hmm. Folks, we change, all right? A hundred pounds later, here I am, okay? With all my hair gone, here I am. But we all change. But there's no growth without change. And then, I want to say this, finally, there are transitions in life. In nature, God teaches us that's constantly. We're approaching summer, then there's going to be fall, then there's going to be winter, then there's going to be spring. And it's going to happen over and over again. It's happened all the days that you've been alive. And in your life, you began in infancy, you became an adolescent, you became a teen. Oh, God help us, those teen years. Then you became a young adult. Then you're in adulthood. And now you're senior adult. And boy, what used to work doesn't work like it used to work, does it? But uh, remember this, there's a difference in mourning and moaning. There's a difference in weeping and whining. There's a difference in grieving and grumbling. Pain is inevitable, but growth is optional. You're going to experience pain, but here's what you need to do. God, may this be a stepping stone. Help me to become what you want me to become. Amen. There's nothing greater than spiritual growth in the life of a believer. And God looks down from heaven and God says, my child is growing. Just like when you see your children. This morning, I'll tell you what we did. We, we saw Sheila, David Sheila Temple's uh, granddaughter and their granddaughter. I mean, the last time I saw her, she was a little tiny little thing, and now she's twice the size. And we marveled at how she grew. And that's how you are when you bring your children. And that's how God is when He looks at us. He loves to see growth. But how do we do it? We got to press on. We got to press on. Right. I'm pressing on the other way. You might.